the next speaker is Liz Parrish. Is she, uh, can she share her screen? Please mute yourself. Okay, yeah. So um, Liz Parrish is the founder and CEO of BioViva. Uh, she is a humanitarian, an entrepreneur, an innovator, an author, a podcaster, and a leading voice for genetic cures. And if I can say it myself, I think her positivity and her enthusiasm for this field is very infectious. So I give the floor now to Liz Parrish. So, um, hi, I'm here to talk about BioViva and what we're doing in the gene therapy space. So we are committed to treating biological aging with gene therapy. And um, recently we've had uh, more advancements in our gene therapy delivery method uh, because our focus is larger payloads uh, for lower doses. We're pretty um, sure that treating biological aging is going to take more than one gene. And so we want to get that into one delivery method for you. So here uh, we're looking at lifespan and health span. And as most people on this call know, uh, we spend far too much time in ill health. So we're hoping that regenerative medicine will not only help us extend health span, but lifespan as well. We are pretty interested in doing more than squaring the curve. Squaring the curve is kind of morbid. You live really healthy and then you drop off. But of course, we're hoping that regenerative medicine will take you along much further than that. But the importance of this is that we spend a lot of time in ill health, as I had already said. And, you know, when we start to get... Uh, I don't know, we start to get time to actually take vacations and do the things that we want in life, we have a real diminishing return on health. And you can see that here in this curve. We are less healthy and less able to do the things we like to do as we get older. And that's quite unfortunate. Of course, uh, aging as is at the core of that. I personally believe that aging is a disease. It's the master disease that causes the symptoms of things like cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes, and uh, a myriad of organ failures and diminishing health. So I believe that every civilized society in this day and age should be working to cure biological aging. For those of you that are interested in what's happening in gene therapy globally, there are a myriad of approvals. So gene therapy has proven itself through the best proof of concept, something called monogenic disease. So people who are born with congenital disorders, a single gene mutation, are now seeing curative effects through gene therapy. And in some of the cases, these may be one treatment for a lifetime or only two or three. And that's pretty amazing. So that was a great proof of concept space for gene therapy to show us that this, in fact, was the route to go. With BioViva, of course, we're interested in complex disorders. So treating complex disorders like aging is going to be more difficult. It won't be a one and done gene therapy. Um, and how we know this is we have some uh, work in the space. We started in AAV, which is adeno-associated virus. And that's a, a very small uh, viral vector that can get genes into cells. Now, when we talk about gene therapy and viral vectors, these are not viruses that will get you sick. Their ability to deliver their own genetic payload has been removed. And now what they do is they deliver therapeutic payloads. So they deliver genes that make you healthier. And uh, we have two peer-reviewed papers in this space. Uh, the first one is around my gene therapy. So in 2015, I took two gene therapies to treat biological aging. Uh, one of them was called telomerase reverse transcriptase. And it, of all the genes that we look at, targets the most hallmarks of aging. And the hallmarks of aging are sort of our uh, company's uh, targets for reversing biological aging. It gives us a biomarker uh, to look at of whether or not we have had an effect on the cell. 
And so with telomerase reverse transcriptase, we do things like lengthen telomeres. They also have a lot of off-target uh, moonlighting that seems to happen in the cells with the uh, advent of the upregulation of telomerase reverse transcriptase. And those things we're learning over time. And they all seem to be so far uh, beneficial uh, to uh, aging associated diseases. So we, uh, published this paper last year. This was all just about my telomere work. Um, one doctor had a specific interest in the telomere specific work. We hope to come out with a paper with all of the uh, results of everything. I've, I can tell you that there hasn't been any negative data in my work, but a lot of it is blood work, which is, you know, um, some doctors like to look at that and some doctors don't because it's actually quite a lot of data. But anyway, what we can see is from 2015, from my first gene therapy to my last in 2020, we ha I have had an increase in my telomere length. And so one of the things that we hope that that will help with is things like cellular senescent with uh, communicable diseases, things like COVID, it might be able to help a lot of people. But uh, telomerase has a lot of other benefits to the cells that we'll talk about in a later study. Another thing that we did is we are definitely a huge proponent of getting drugs into humans as fast as possible for the ethical use of these technologies. In 2020, we were part of a study that was done on five patients for dementia. This was a study of telomerase reverse transcriptase and clotho delivered intranasally again to five patients. And let's look at a little bit about these gene candidates more in depth so you understand why we use these in dementia. So telomerase reverse transcriptase has a, a tenacious ability to repair telomeres, something that get degraded and shorter as we age. It seems to have a, a wonderful effect on mitochondrial health, which is something that is failing in an aging population. It improves genomic stability. And of course, we hope that in the future, we'll be able to show that this may actually stave off things like cancer and aging people. It reduces senescent cells. But in research in other peer-reviewed papers, we saw that it also reduced tau tangles. And so this made it an interesting candidate for uh, dementia with a, with uh, the potential of Alzheimer's. It was associated with reduced plaques and it protects animals against uh, biological aging and animal research. The second gene was clotho. Uh, clotho uh, may improve brain function and cognitive ability. It was found in a research paper upon autopsy, people who appeared to have uh, uh, Alzheimer's upon autopsy, that's when they find that the beta amyloid plaques and the degradation of the, the uh, brain, they, people who were upregulators for clotho naturally didn't show the cognitive decline around the disease. So that would be really beneficial. It's also associated with upregulating a couple of genes that are associated with uh, healthy longevity, FGF21 and FGF23. It seems to help clear damage caused by oxidative stress. And it's low when, as you age, clotho levels are lower in your body and that's associated with chronic kidney disease and cardiovascular disease. So it may have some sort of benefit. After we released our paper, a paper came out that showed that it was also associated with less beta amyloid plaques. So that was pretty cool. And again, this is another extender of model organisms lifespan. So what did we see in the dementia study? We saw improved cognitive scores and we saw lengthened telomeres in the shortest telomeres in the, uh, the T lymphocytes. And that was kind of uh, surprising. We didn't think that we, we had done a very low uh, dose of gene therapy, which might point to that the, a low dose could be beneficial in an aged population for uh, immune senescence. But uh, we didn't even think that we needed to look at telomeres because it was such a low dose delivered intranasally, but we decided to do it and we were very glad we did. The Fulstein testing scores were the biggest excitement around this uh, treatment. It did not seem to be a cure for most persons, although one person went from assisted living and is still living on their own two years later. And that's pretty excited. exciting. Out of the five patients, one patient seemed to have uh, no benefit at all. 
So um, just a little plug, we're raising money to do another study and we want to increase the dose uh, to see if we can get a better effect in the gene therapy. <clears throat> and we'll actually have two arms, one with the two gene therapies and one with three gene therapies. We have another target. <clears throat> Our company has been working for several years um, on creating a better platform for gene therapy. So when we looked at the gene therapy space and participated in it, <clears throat> we found that the problem really with gene therapy and complex disorders like aging is that today's most commonly used viral vector is too small to treat complex disorders. If for instance, in 2020, I decided to try four different genes associated with treating biological aging. And to take those four genes, I had to take four different therapeutics. Uh, there are known toxic uh, doses of that gene therapy. And so we have to be very careful that we stay within certain parameters. And it's just vastly inefficient. My goal was to get all of these into one vector so we could predictably deliver gene therapy at a lower doses. So we went back to the drawing board and we started working with a vector called cytomegalovirus. This is a tenacious uh, virus that al almost all of the population already has. Uh, it has its own genes to run under the immune system so that uh, it can uh, essentially be very persistent. It has it doesn't have much of a negative effect on the body unless you are on immune suppressants or you are very elderly. Of course, we are not getting you sick <clears throat> with the virus. We are using the viral capsid to deliver healthy therapeutic genes. So it really met what we needed to deliver large <clears throat> payloads and uh, do it under the radar of the immune system. And we wanted to test things like redosing. We wanted to test and see if we could actually give this intranasally and have a persistent uh, upregulation of the genes as we might want to see in the perfect gene therapy delivery method. <clears throat> so in 2022, we released a three years <laughs> in the in the making uh, paper uh, that was associated with what happened with this vector in mouse model. We use two genes. One of them is called folostatin. It um, increases muscle mass by blocking something called myostatin. It improves nutrient sensing. It seems to combat against metabolic uh, disorder. Uh, and I'll show you some of the data around that later. And um, this could be a very beneficial gene for an aging population who are suffering with frailty. It also is an extender of lifespan in model organisms. The second gene we used is one that I've already talked about. It's telomerase reverse transcriptase. And uh, we chose these two genes because they already have a good deal of information on them. And it was important for us to see if the delivery method was working. And so, you know, this is this is uh, was the focus of these two arms. These genes were not given together. They were given separately. So there was a control group, a group that only got the viral vector, and then the two arms of the telomerase group, one intranasally, uh, one intraperitonally, and then two arms of the folostatin group, again, separate, one intranasally and one intraperitonally. And so we treated these mice when they were about the equivalent age of 57, 56, 57 in human years. We wanted to do wild type mice so that we could see the, the biggest benefit. And, and this is what we saw. In the telomerase reverse transcriptase mice, we got a maximum lifespan gain of 41%. And in the folostatin group, we got a 32.5% gain in lifespan. And the best thing about this is was the power of the technology. Not one of the treated mice died within the time of the controls. And that's really important. Um, George Church is one of our advisors. And I had asked him if this was a large enough study. And he said, yeah, it's based on the impact of the therapeutic. And we definitely um, saw that impact. 
So uh, in body mass, the telomerase uh, reverse transcriptase mice maintain their body mass longer. The fullostatin mice were definitely much bigger, 33% bigger in, in muscle mass. Uh, task performance, the task performance of the TERT mice was over five times uh, faster than the controls and the fullostatin mice three times faster. So this points to, um, you know, maintaining body mass and better cognition. The glucose tolerance was um, must substantially better in both groups. Uh, telomerase in all groups performed better than fullostatin. Glycated hemoglobin was definitely lower, the, the best again in, in the telomerase group. So what was uh, improved uh, overall was uh, fur. Visually, both groups had much better fur. Um, the telomerase reverse tra transcriptase group, when the controls were dying, you can see the controls in the upper right-hand corner, the telomerase group in the mid uh, area and fullostatin in the lower uh, right-hand corner. Uh, the telomerase group, the uh, vets thought that they were eight-month-old mice. And that's that's pretty amazing. Uh, mitochondria, we tested mitochondria. It was better in both treated groups. Uh, muscle mass, of course, was much improved in the fullostatin group. Activity was higher, and there was no increased risk of cancer in our treated mice. Let's see. Let's go to the next one. So um, what could this mean if things translated directly to humans, which, um, you know, this is my, my, my whole life's work will be translating medicine to humans because it's the most important. And I don't think that mice are highly predictive of outcome in humans. Uh, let's hope that humans even do better than this. <laughs> So we started treatment when the mice were 18 months old, and that would be around that 56, 57 in human uh, years. If you were going to live an average lifespan in the US to about, let's say, 78, um, if you took folistatin, you might live to be 100 years old. And if you took the telomerase reverse transcriptase, you might live to be over a supercentenarian. And that's pretty exciting. Again, one uh, hallmark of this study was that we did redosing. And that is um, could be very important uh, for especially things like neurodegeneration and uh, chronic conditions that are harder to get on top of. Yes. So it's not enough just to have the technology. People definitely need to use it. And um, I cannot state that enough. I, I'm certainly um, probably the biggest proponent for the bioethical debate of using uh, technology and de-risking it through human use, not animal use. One of the projects that we have done in order to keep the uh, population abreast of what's happening in gene therapy is something called the Code Keeper. Uh, please visit it. It's bioviva-codekeeper.com. It gives people the ability to look up their conditions, see what's happening in gene therapy, and it has a subscription model for people who are engineering gene therapies or medical doctors to actually uh, pull the sequences, the promoters, and more. So um, this is a great place to go if you have a child with a disease, if you're suffering with a disease, and you're interested in what's happening in this space, maybe you can find a lab to fund. Maybe you can spin out a company and license some of this technology. I'm a huge proponent that we need more people in this space driving this technology forward. I wanna thank our team uh, that have been amazing and um, are trying to help to streamline our preclinical work towards uh, human clinical trials. Uh, we're very excited about that. and. Um, we hope that it's a big success. If I have a couple more minutes, I want to talk briefly about best choice medicine, a humane route to drug 
uh, delivery. Again, I think the most important thing that we can do is to get human data, and there are humans who are dying. Today, while we're having this presentation and this nice uh, conversation about treating biological aging, over 100,000 people will die of these diseases, and we really need to call out and make sure that the uh, regulatory systems are held accountable to these deaths, that risk aversion isn't responsible for more deaths today than we could save. Uh, last year, or this year, rather, uh, Bill Andrews and I put out a paper uh, that is suggesting this route uh, for uh, non-communicable uh, aging-associated disease burden, and I think that it's uh, very important that the discussion starts now. I do believe that we have the technology to already help people live longer and healthier and get them to the next stage where we have therapies that actually cure aging. This platform gives multitude of companies the ability to work together to bring their data together if they choose to. We hope that they do to cure aging. We do not believe that one modality on its own will cure all of biological aging. We think that the um, industry needs to bring these uh, drug candidates, we need to identify them, we need to get them into an informational database, we need review boards to look at them and to um, approve or push them forward towards uh, human access. Upon patient access, we need these drug, uh, the drug discovery information reshared with the system. We need good drugs to go into clinical trials and get to the masses and bad drugs to leave the system. Uh, we need to do this because uh, we need people to get access to these medicines earlier in technological advancement than they already are. Uh, the, the, all of the genes that BioViva works with, we work with about seven genes now, have meta-analysis. They've been around for over a decade. They've extended animal lifespan, and, and translating them to human has just been too slow and too difficult, and that is really disappointing. We owe it to our children to leave this world a better place than we found it, and we have the opportunity to maybe stay here a very long time, enriching the future with the information that we have garnered over a lifetime and making the world a better place. So with that, I want to thank you. I hope that you live long and well, and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that you might have. Okay. We already have some questions. Uh, let me start with the first one. Uh, Walter Crompton in the chat asks, amazing results. What are the prospects for accessibility of gene therapy, uh, specifically regarding the cost of the treatment? Yeah, so the, the great thing about treating biological aging. So again, I think two days ago, we just had another story come out in the media that hemophilia now has a treatment through gene therapy, but it is now the most expensive gene therapy on the planet. Every gene therapy that seems to be launched for monogenic disease, one by one becomes the most expensive uh, drug on the planet. But the great thing about biological aging is we can actually scale it. So um, when we're when, if we use genes that have shared proteins, um, things unlike telomerase reverse transcriptase that we seem to need to get into every cell, but things like folostatin and clotho and PGC1 alpha and FGF21, these type of genes, they actually we don't have to do a large dose of gene therapy. We could do a gene therapy localized in one part of your body, and the proteins will share to your entire body, and that has been uh, really the focus. Of, of George Church trying to find you know, these genes in which you would take a much lower dose, much like an immuniz immunization against aging. Then we work with those genes uh, here at BioViva, and we also work with genes that are a little bit more difficult in which we need to get into most cells of the body. And that makes a more expensive gene therapy because it's a higher dose. Again, these are not live vectors. So the, the dose that we administer is the dose you get. They don't replicate. 
Um, I do believe that these will be uh, massively affordable, especially compared to the cost of aging, and that this could be done um, with uh, sufficient funding and su sufficient backing by the regulatory su system and uh, large, large uh, companies. Okay, Josie also had a question. Uh, yes, hello, Liz. Uh, always great to see uh, you and uh, your presentation. I have two quick questions. Number one, how do you track the impact of different gene therapies if you are combining them? And second, uh, a friend of mine just went to a mini circle in Roatan, Honduras for a folistatin therapy. How does that compare to, to yours? Do, do you know? Yeah, so uh, that's great. I'll, I'll handle the second one first. So with MiniCircle, they're doing uh, plasmids. And so they have a temporary effect on the body. Uh, they'll last for some amount of time. With gene therapy, you're actually getting a persistent, uh, probably 10, 20 year um, uh, persistence of the, the gene and the protein. So uh, I think that it's great. We've had a lot of people reach out to us who are part of that study who say that if they like the effects, they're going to go to medical tourism uh, to participate in um, the, the gene therapy for the persistent uh, effect of the gene. And um, so when we're looking at uh, gene therapy, so to, uh, to be clear, we our company cannot give uh, gene therapies to patients, uh, unfortunately, because we're a U.S. company. We have to work within the, the regulatory system of the United States. But what we can do is assess data of medical tourism. So since, the, since my information came out and more information came out around gene therapies and longevity and the potential uh, benefits of these, uh, different medical tourism companies have popped up to offer these technologies which is which actually shows our regulatory system that there is a push that you know the the pot is boiling over and if people don't have access to technologies they will leave the country to go get them so um that's my best choice medicine is a uh, plan is to try to to bring within the regulatory zones the bigger countries of the world and an ethical platform for this pre-testing of these drugs so that the FDA uh, gets human data rather than mouse data going in and they'll have a much more likely success. So when we look at medical tourism data, so, you know, there would be some companies out there and if you guys are connected to them who might not track data, please put them in touch with us. We think that it's an imperative to create um, evidence-based medicine, even off of medical tourism. And so when we're looking at a gene therapy um, and people going through gene therapy process, we're looking at several things. Number one, a lot of pre-testing has to be done, a lot of baseline. There, this often is MRI images or FMRI, MRI if it has to do with dementia. This has to do with uh, maybe if it's associated with telomere links, a lot of telomere testing, uh, blood work, and then anything, if they're treating a specific disease, we need all of the disease specific uh, biomarkers. And then after they go through the gene therapy, then we would test them uh, a myriad of times, three, six, uh, nine, and 12 months. And then we follow them for years doing testing over years. So we want to see if the, the gene therapies are persistent, if they've had an effect, things like epigenetic age, uh, microbiome, telomere length, and then uh, the regular associated uh, blood and imaging. So this um, is something that we're very committed to again, and I think that it's important. So you're, you're, there was actually two parts to your first question, and, and it was, how would you know that multiple genes are working? So that is, um, that is actually a really interesting uh, zone of understanding because that we're really at the beginning of that. So right now uh, with BioViva, we're doing our human cell testing. So we test one gene uh, at a time, and then you know we see the little uh, benefit of that single gene, and then we're trying to get the super monster wave. You know, have you ever done that with a with a speaker where you you add all of this sound, and then you try to get a super wave, and and of course that's where 
where we would look to really strongly affect aging. So what we can do right now in human cells when we do combinatorial gene therapies is we can see that each of the proteins, we want to make sure that the proteins were upregulated in the cells. And then we want to see how well they live. And then of course, you know, we have to go to animal models and uh, humans. So you know, it, it, it will take time. Uh, the most important thing is what happens in a human. And so that's why it's most important that we do the ethical use of these technologies in the humans who need them most, and then watch them over time. So we could do a bunch of fabulous things in a mouse and, <laughs> and, and it may never translate, or it, like I said, it may be better. So, you know, uh, human data is most important. Okay, our next speaker, uh, Aubrey, has a very quick question, but let's keep it quick because we're already four minutes over time. Yeah, right. You don't really have a choice, do you? Because I'm the next speaker anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, yeah, it's not actually a question so much as I wanted to bring the group's attention to a paper that came out yesterday, which is very relevant to Liz's talk. Um, and I've put the link to it in the chat. I'm feeling fairly smug about it because it is the implementation of an idea that I put forward first about eight years ago um, and that we did a little bit of work on in Sense Research Foundation. Essentially, uh, as Liz very correctly mentioned, CMV has some advantages over AAV in terms of both uh, cargo size and immunogenicity. Uh, but we'd like to go further in both of those regards. And this technology does exactly that. The idea is basically to overcome the limitation of CRISPR in terms of um, its um, ability to insert DNA, uh, but to take advantage of the ability of the of what CRISPR has in terms of the location within the genome that it interferes with which is, of course, something that's quite important in gene therapy because we don't want to have any, well, we want to minimize the risk of random integration of any um, uh, structure uh, which might um, have oncogenic effects. So the idea is to do it in two steps, to use CRISPR to insert what's called a landing pad for a completely different system called an integrase, uh, which can insert basically anything you like. And um, it's got the potential, which appears, I haven't seen the full text yet, to be had to have been realized in this study. Uh, it's got the potential to insert up to, you know, tens of KB, maybe up to 50 KB into the genome all in one go and to insert it in a chosen location. So I'm really pretty happy about this. It's a very exciting study and I encourage everybody to have a look at it. Uh, that's it. I didn't have a question. That's great. So in comparison to CMV, um, CMV also can do 50 KB. And then our focus is kind of the opposite. We're looking to create an episome. So we don't want to um, edit the human genome. Uh, we're not using CRISPR with our technology, although we could. Uh, we could deliver that 50 KB of, of uh, CRISPR technology. But the, the beauty of the episome is not uh, disrupting the human chromosome and, and not risking the integrational mutagenesis that, that has been found in some of the lentiviruses. So that is awesome. That gives me some reading today. Thank you, Aubrey. <laughs> okay. Um, so Aubrey, by the way, um, if you need the full text, I can send you that article if you need it. Rock and roll, please do that. Okay, good. Uh, so 